Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ms. Muggsy Show. I'm so excited about tonight's guest. i got to calm down. Um, I hardly ever get this excited, but uh, my guest this evening is Stuart Swordlow, who has a wealth of information, not only in experiences, but he's done his own research, and he's also very intuitive. I watched a couple of his videos for the last few weeks, and I was just so impressed with him. And um, his wife helped me, Janet, to uh, hook this up. So I'm going to bring Stuart on for everybody to meet. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, Muggsy. How you doing? Great. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Um, there's so many gaps between our history and the knowledge that's being put out there. And I'm really hoping that you can help us fill those gaps in. Sure. You just ask whatever you like, and uh, if I know the answer, I'll tell you. Okay, I got a list of stuff. Um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you about is 9-11. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, Your of course, stuff. a big topic today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Today's the perfect day to do it, and I'm so glad you were willing to do this tonight. So I wanted to get your input on what 9-11 means to you. Yeah, well, that's a tremendous topic, and, geez, I've been writing about it for 10 years. And so what, what was 9-11 about? It was actually a, a global ritual sacrifice in order for the Illuminati to impose the rules and regulations that we are unfortunately live under right now. But the Twin Towers represent twinning programming. They represented the dual human and reptilian uh, DNA that we have on in our bodies. It also represented uh, phallic symbol, sexual ritual. Oh, there were so many things that were uh, that 9/11 was about. Uh, I even recently spoke about how when the towers came down. Uh, if those those of you who watched the, some of the videos in slow motion, you actually could see faces of demonic entities in the smoke and ash as the buildings crashed down and, and moved forward into the city. So there was a lot of layers of ritual and uh, symbolism that the Illuminati used when they picked this day. The other thing that I have a sneaking feeling is that somehow they opened up a portal because I just posted a bunch of videos of five gargoyle-looking uh, beings that were jumping around the buildings. Yeah, and that was what I, what I saw in the smoke. Um, when, when, if you watch those videos in slow motion, you will see those uh, faces and those entities in the smoke. And yes... Um, there were actually nuclear devices that had been placed underground uh, in those buildings even before, well, during the time that they were built because it was already scheduled to happen in 1973 when those buildings were put up. And those, um, those uh, atomic weapons that were used actually registered on a seismograph in New York City uh, a couple of seconds before the, the, uh, the air aircraft hit the buildings. And so when you use a nuclear weapon in an area like that, it does open up a vortex. And what people don't realize also in that area near 14th Street, which is in the downtown area not far from the, the World Trade Center, there is a huge uh, opening in the earth, like a fault line, that cuts across Manhattan at that point. And so there's seismic energy, there was atomic energy, uh, there was other uh, ELF and microwave pulses that were blasted at the same time. And that opened up or, or ripped a hole in the dimensional integrity of that area, and that is why, uh, correct, uh, a vortex was opened up. And I also know that people that had um, contacts, that are contactees, either from the Dromedans or the Syrians, that all of, on that day, if there was any contacts, they immediately left. And the ones that were supposed to show up did not show up on that day. Do you know about that? Well, I haven't heard about that one before, 
but I am sure that it has to do with the ELF transmissions that were bombarding the area and put a dampening field over everything um, so that people wouldn't be aware of what was going on and wouldn't be able to communicate. Um, and that's still going on. If you go to Manhattan uh, these days, and I was passing through there a couple of months ago, uh, there is a very heavy energy, like a, what I call a dampening field, kind of like a blanket of energy that's thrown over the area so that uh, mental uh, or hyperspace communications are not really possible. There's a block on the pineal gland. Uh, there's a block on the energy fields. And uh, they're putting up this uh, freedom tower, which really will be like a gigantic antenna that will then be used as uh, a connector uh, from satellite transmissions and other things uh, to the city area. What about, um, OK, I saw videos, and I'm not sure I know this subject very well, but you, you probably do, the cubes and creating time and space. Because out on Ellis Island, they had some kind of a pyramid that after the Twin Towers went down, this pyramid completely disappeared off this barge. And they're saying it has something to do with the time and space continuum. Do you know about that? No, I haven't heard about that one. That's a new, uh, new story for me. I have to look into that one. They said something about it, it, that it altered our energy and altered the timeline, and that that's what they were trying to do, and it has something to do with cubes, but I, I'm not really versed in it. Um, okay, what about you have experience, and maybe you might want to tell people, um, I mentioned that you do have intuition, and you can actually see into other dimensions. Is that correct? Yes, that was um, that ha happened with me when I was at the Montauk Project for 13 years, uh, where they tried to create a person who could see into other realities without the use of a device. And so at that time, they created conditions where I became physically blind, and all I could see were energy fields that emanated from living things as well as inanimate objects. And from that, uh, I learned what they call the language of hyperspace, which is, for all intents and purposes, the energy and communication that God-mind uses in order to create and manifest, which is color, tone, and archetype symbol. And so that's basically what I was involved in all those years. Um, and I learned to read energy fields, uh, know what the colors and symbols mean. Uh, it even emanates from the genetics or DNA so that you can read a person's history just by uh, looking at their, their, their energy field. And if you know how to use the color, tone, and archetype symbol in a correct format, you can create formulas with this that will then enable you to manifest physically anything that you want to create. You can solve a huge mystery for me. Um, when I do my readings, I see like a soul. And it, uh, the soul has um, a soul group um, color that comes with it. And, and I always get these four colors. I get either blue, violet, gold, or white. But I have no idea what they mean. Do you? Yes. Well, what you're seeing there is actually the person's connection to their oversoul or their higher intelligence from which the life stream emanates. When you look at blue, which I imagine you might be saying royal blue there, royal blue is the entry code into hyperspace and also emanates from the pineal gland and acts as a liaison between the physical and the non-physical. The violet is a filtering and protection of energy that emanates from the crown chakra of every human being and also connects to the God mind and the non-physical energy. Gold is the God mind color. That is the, one of the highest uh, color energies that you can manifest uh, on the earth plane. And the white is the totality of all energies everywhere. It's the totality of the God mind of all creation. So that's what you're seeing 
when you look at uh, an energy field of a person. And of course, those colors are really the very higher colors, or the ones that are really going beyond the, the physical. So then what you need to do is look uh, below that, uh, the lower frequencies, if you're going to do any reading on the person's physical self. Wow. Thank you for that. Oh, you're when you were in Montauk, now I would imagine that, I mean, that would be a horrific situation, but souls develop. What, what were you, maybe consciously or unconsciously, wanting to learn from that? And what do you think that you took from that that you're now going to apply to humanity? Well, that's a very, very big question, and my feeling on that is well, I had to learn, uh, really basically first understand about victimization mind pattern, where a person allows others to intrude into their energy or space and to uh, abuse and traumatize them. And unfortunately, most of humanity has a victimization mind pattern. And that's why we as individuals and as a species attract tyrants and depressors like the Illuminati and, and other and alien groups. And so I feel my lessons in the Montauk Project were about how to, first of all, recognize the victimization mind pattern and then learn how to undo it so that others can be taught how to release this so that there's no longer abuse and trauma in the life. So that's kind of the bottom line answer I have there. And ever since then, I've developed um, visualizations uh, and imageries uh, and techniques in order to uh, uh, re do release work from the mind pattern, grow up the child within, communicate with the oversoul, deprogram from all the mind control so that the person can be uh, personally empowered and then once they're aware of their oversoul and God mind within and no longer associate with the victimization mind pattern, then they can help others to do the same thing and overcome all of this negativity and tyranny that we have on the planet uh, and take the power back for each individual and for the entire human species. I was really impressed. I, I bought your book, I think it was about a year ago, and I, I would read parts of it and I would get so upset and I'd have to put it down because of some of the stuff that you experienced. And uh, it really hit me that you must be a very strong, powerful soul to endure that and then be able to teach others without tripping yourself or to get into that mentality or mindset of victimization? Well, it was a very, very difficult experience. And, you know, it, it, it still can be, even now, um, that I've gone through all these years of release work and deprogramming because you know, uh, Ms. Muggsy, that there are a lot of people out there in this world who um, fear the information and uh, kind of shoot the messenger, and they, they attack others who try to help uh, people. And I found that to be quite interesting because I always had thought that if uh, you go out there in the world and you try to help people and give information, etc., that it would be understood and appreciated, and most of the time it is. However, there is a percentage of the population out there, and it is a kind of a smaller percentage, but still they're, they're there, who reject all of the information, want to stay in their victimization and anger and frustration, and attack those who try to help. And perhaps you've seen that in your own work as well. Um, but uh, you have to really be, like you say, a strong-willed and tough-skinned, uh, so that you can withstand all of that and keep moving forward. Because, you know, there are times when you think, well, why am I doing this kind of work? No one appreciates it, uh, that kind of thing, and you want to just change and do something else. But then you have to realize 
this is why I came into this reality at this time, uh, to experience all of this, uh, to assimilate it, understand it, release it, and then show others how to do that. And no matter what happens, no matter what's thrown at you, you continue and you persevere because at the end of that road, there is the, the benefit and the reward for all of it. Well said. Most of us don't deal with the extreme that you did with uh, the Montauk and the mind programming. However, I was listening to a couple of your interviews, and you were talking about a dream interpretation, and when you would do an analysis, you could point out um, the dreams that were actually mind conditioning, and I thought that was fabulous. There, yeah, and when I do my dream interpretation, I do categorize them uh, first into into two different sections. I say, okay, this is either an oversoul dream or this is a programming dream, and since uh, just about quite honestly, everyone on the earth has some form of programming, that means at least a percentage of their dreams will be a programming dream. Now, there are uh, about 15% at this point of people on the earth who are very, very deeply programmed. And such people have sometimes over 70% of their dreams as programming dreams. But no matter how deeply programmed you are, you must also have oversoul dreams because that is the release valve of all the energy of the mind and the status report of the life that the dreams reveal. And so I look at all of those uh, symbolisms in the dreams and uh, determine, uh, if, is this a, an oversoul dream or a programming dream? But uh, no matter what, the symbolisms uh, mean something to that person and need to be understood no matter what kind of a dream it is. Um, but th when the person has a programming dream and understands the symbolism, then they also have deprogramming work to do so that they can undo uh, these functions and uh, alter compartments that are within their matrix. You know, um, I was just thinking, there's nobody better than you to help me with this next question. Um, a lot of the truth movement, we deal with the sheeple, the ones that are heavily mind-controlled, and they're very much stuck in that matrix. How would one, other than venting, how would one or what would be the best approach to deal with somebody like that, especially if it's a spouse or parents or children? What could you give them as a recommendation to guide them through to deal just with the people in their close proximity? Well, you're, you're talking uh, when, you, when a person or a spouse or almost close to you recognizes that you're switching into an altar. Is that what you mean? Well, everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people seem to be uh, programmed because they just blindly, like you said, they have this victimized mentality. Um, they say things like, well, I can't do anything about it, or what do you want me to do about it? But Or they don't want to hear it. They'll just tell you, look, i got to pay my credit cards. I, I don't want to deal with this. i got a mortgage. I, got, I, I don't want to hear this. I can't hear this. But then they fall in the trap of getting more victimized because they don't see the problems coming. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are trying to help our fam family members just to see the big picture. But they're so programmed from the via the TV set that we, we can't break them out of this sheeple mentality. Yeah, and when these things happen, I do recommend that people use the violet uh, flush or ultimate protection technique uh, so that, uh, first of all, it prevents further triggering or activation of the programming or mind control of that person. Then I do recommend using the brown merger symbol at the pineal gland, which will then help to reintegrate the alters within the programming matrix and reunify 
the original personality of that person. Um, and also to use the silver infinity of the oversoul symbol, which you visualize over the crown chakra. And that can guide and protect um, and direct uh, the person so that they make proper decisions and are able to recognize when they are being triggered into an altar. So there are things that you can do um, to help uh, in these situations. I also suggest that these people uh, some, uh, eat uh, heavier proteins in order to ground and balance them or even use the color brown in and around themselves so that they are centered and, and not uh, swayed one way or the other. And I do write about uh, these kind of things in uh, my books, 13 Cubed and True Reality of Sexuality and even uh, Hyperspace Helper, um, so that if people learn these techniques, they will be able to, uh, to refocus and ground and balance and be minimally affected uh, by the mind control and programming that's targeting them. Is there a way to raise your energy levels so that the mind programming that's thrown at us will not take a hold? Yeah, Do you understand? Okay. Yes, yes, and there's two ways. There's physical and non-physical ways to do that. Uh, for the physical ways to do that is, again, uh, what I mentioned earlier, uh, to eat heavier uh, organic proteins, which ground and balance the body and build it and nourish it uh, and prevent uh, the artificial uh, stuff from going through. And people should really uh, stay to a diet that is uh, as organic as possible and drink a lot of distilled water, which flushes the body of the chemicals and toxins that add to the programming and mind control. Uh, and also to do physical exercise, whether it's weight training or aerobics or some kind of exercise where the body is built up and, and strengthened. That's on the physical side. On the mental side or energetic side, of course, we need to keep our chakras in good order. And I do teach how to go every morning through your chakra bands and enhance the colors from bottom to top, balancing your T-bar at the pineal gland so that the left and right hemispheres of the brain um, have an even flow of energy and you're not on one side or another. And again, to use the oversoul information, and to use the violet protection around you, and you can enhance that by using even layers of silver and uh, gold around you to raise the vibratory rate. Uh, because once you get to the violet level and above, the ELF and microwave pulses really cannot penetrate that because they get dis diffused through the higher energies. So we there's two. So those are the two things you need to to ground and balance the body, strengthen it, and to raise the vibratory rate energetically so that these, uh, these mind control and programming energies are, are repelled or diffused in the, in the energy field. I was wondering, I, I know you know how to do this. If you could uh, walk us through just briefly, everybody wants to know how to get more in touch with their higher consciousness one and number two i think it's really important if we're going to be doing this and starting to raise our consciousness that we have protection so what would you offer as advice for somebody that's just getting going yes uh, for protection the color violet filters and protects the body and i teach uh, something called the ultimate protection technique where you Visualize yourself in the center of a violet tetrahedron, and then that goes into the middle of a violet octahedron. And you keep that around you 24-7, and then nothing can penetrate that. So that's the ultimate protection technique. Also need to balance your T-bar where you center at the pineal gland in royal blue, and in a matter of seconds, or even one or two seconds, you will see your T-bar, which could look either like a capital T, a small T or cross, or an onk. 
All three are equal in value. It's simply a question of genetics. And you look at the crossbars of that T-bar, and depending on your emotions or thoughts at that moment, the crossbars could be tilted or leaning or twisted in some way, and you mentally straighten them out so that they're completely perpendicular and form right angles. And this will regulate the thought processes between the left and right hemispheres of the brain so your thinking does not go to extreme. And it will also connect to the pituitary gland, hypothalamus, thyroid, and thymus glands to regulate all of the chemical and hormonal flows of the body. So it's a very powerful exercise, and I do recommend doing that in the morning when you get out of bed and in the evening before you go to sleep, at least those two times, and any time of the day or night where you feel unsettled or imbalanced. If for some reason you have a difficulty seeing your T-bar, what you can do instead is visualize at the pineal gland a royal blue circle and put a royal blue dot in the center of that circle. Centering the dot in the circle is equal to balancing the arms of the T-bar. So these will help to protect the body, uh, balance the mind and, and the endocrine system, and put the person in a condition where they're able to uh, withstand uh, and, and get through any kind of ELF bombardment that goes going on around them. Wow, that's great information. Thank you. Um, I have yet to see somebody explain the Merkaba, um, and some, some truthers won't even touch it. Um, would you mind? Well, it's a matter of semantics. See, I don't use that terminology. For me, it's the star tetrahedron. Um, because, you know, the word Merkaba is actually an ancient Hebrew word that is, uh, means a Roman chariot. Um, so there's a connotation there that I don't care for, so I just call it a star tetrahedron. And basically, it's a, a, a star tetrahedron pointing up and, and, and another tetrahedron pointing down and interlocking. Um, and I surround that, and I, first of all, create it all in gold, and I surround it in a gold circle, which uh, is an archetype statement that says that there's protection above and below, physical and non-physical, in your space. Um, and in fact, I have a pendant that we make, a uh, star tetrahedron that I wear whenever I travel, that replicates this energy in your auric field so that you're constantly protected at all times. And there's other uses of it which kind of get more, a little more complicated um, you know, to talk about on, the, on this particular show, but um, it can be used as a communication device. It can be used to view uh, interdimensional spaces or times, if you will. Um, and it is a very powerful uh, tool uh, to use. What about, I heard you mention something about, this is off subject, but weather anomalies. Mm-hmm. And I, oh, I, I wanted you to teach us what you know. About what's going on in the world with the weather. Yeah. Well, there is a lot going on. In fact, I think I just wrote an article on my site about this a couple of days ago, where there's a couple of things. First of all, there's really two sides of it, because on one hand, there is the Illuminati, or New World Order, which is artificially generating storms, uh, earthquakes, uh, all kinds of anomalies in, in the world in order to uh, create fear and to make people believe that the book of Revelation is coming true. On the other hand, there is the natural earth energy, you know, Mother Earth, saying, I've had enough of all this stuff going on and I'm, I'm cleaning myself. And so the earth itself is going through a change. And when we look at the overall picture of weather uh, patterns, and, and if you watch the TV news and you, and you listen to the weather reports and they say, oh, you know, the statistics uh, are this and the, and the average is that, 
they're really only going back between 50 to 70 years, depending on the location, which, in the scheme of things, is just a very minute portion. In order to really know the weather patterns or the real averages, you have to go back tens of thousands of years. And then you realize that up until recently, the Earth has really been in a warm period of time, but that the actual natural state of the Earth is to be colder. And that's what we're seeing happening. There really is no global warming. That's just a scam perpetrated on the public so that uh, they can get more utility prices and control the, uh, the fuel and resources and, and have people agree to it. That's all that's about. But the Earth is actually getting colder. In fact, in Antarctica, they are recording colder temperatures than ever before, and the snow and ice in Antarctica are deeper than any time before in history that they've ever recorded. That's number one. Second thing is, because of the BP oil disaster in the Gulf last year, it has totally destroyed the Gulf Stream. It, it just does not exist anymore. And so because of that, it does not allow the warmer waters to surface in the, uh, in the ocean, in the, in the Gulf and in the Atlantic Ocean. And so it's allowing colder air from the Arctic to drop down in the winter without being blocked at all. And that's why we have seen this heavier snowfall in North America and in Europe uh, during the winter months because there's nothing blocking the Arctic air from coming down anymore. And then the next thing is, um, we're, according to Russian scientists uh, and even U.S. Navy scientists, the Earth is going into a new ice age. And according to the Russians, we should be in a full-blown ice age by the year 2014, which is only three years away. And if we look at what's going on uh, in the weather anomalies, you know, we have La Nina forming again in the Pacific, which is the colder water, uh, which is permeating the surface there and causing colder temperatures uh, to occur in many of the continents. It also causes heavier rain in some places and drought in other places, which we are seeing. Uh, and in South America, you know, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, is just coming out of their winter, and they have had more snow in South America and in South Africa and Australia than they've ever had before. And even in New Zealand, uh, they had snow uh, even as far no north as the North Island, uh, and they've never recorded that much snow in New Zealand history before. So when we look at all the temperatures and the weather going on, we see that the Earth is getting colder. And I do advise people, uh, those who can, uh, to have greenhouses on their property or if you live in an apartment to get uh, um, uh, boxes uh, by your window where you can grow herbs and, and vegetables, etc. Uh, even getting little fruit trees that you can keep in your house. Uh, because we're going to need that in the coming years. Uh, I, when I go back to the Russian information, they said this ice age could last for 100,000 years. So it's not something that's going to go away very quickly, and we need to take care of that. And, and also when we look at the Gulf, because this is really a critical thing on the Gulf, that was done on purpose. It was literally a ritual sacrifice of the Earth where they they drilled so deeply into the very volatile seabed of the Gulf that they got to a point where the oil was no longer black. The oil was red. So there was red oil coming up, which looked like the earth was bleeding. And that's what they really wanted. They wanted a blood sacrifice of the earth, um, you know, to sacrifice it for what, what they're planning to do in the future. Now, again, because that Gulf Stream is gone, in the summertime, it allowed for heat and humidity to build up in the Gulf and move up inland into the southern states. But then again, the cold air was not blocked, so that came down further south. And so we had stronger clashes 
of hot and cold air, which caused all of those terrible tornadoes and flooding uh, and destruction all over the Midwest and the southern states. And we are unfortunately going to see that happen every year uh, from now on until somehow or another the Gulf Stream is able to be regenerated. So, um, you know, there's a lot going on as far as the weather is concerned. And like I mentioned, some is artificial and some is actually the Earth going into its natural cycle. What about, um, okay, we're in the ascension process, and I don't know where you are with the Mayan calendar or whatever. If you could um, teach us what you know about the ascension process, um, 5D, and also the theory of Dolores Cannon where we're twinning Earth. And as we go to, through the photon belt, the regressives aren't going to be able to go through the photon belt. They're bouncing back, and they'll go on the second Earth, and the, the new Earth will go into the 5D. What do you know about that? Well, here again, I have a very different perspective on all of that. And I know Dolores, and I love Dolores. I think she's a wonderful, kind person. I really think she's super. But she has a different perspective than I do. And maybe it's semantics, and maybe it's just the, the way we look at things. But I'll explain my point of view on all of this. I don't believe in the ascension theory, reason being that I call uh, existence simultaneous existence. That means everything occurs simultaneously. There really is no time and space. It's a, an illusion of physical reality. In actuality, all events in the God mind are occurring at the same moment, and it's simply a question of where we are focused. So from that point of view, we already are at the ascension level. It's just a question of where we want to focus. We don't need any events to bring us to that point. We only need our minds to focus on that, and we are there. So that's how I look at that. As far as the, um, as the uh, Mayan calendar is concerned, here again, a lot of false information, a lot of New Age hype, misunderstanding. You know, when you look at the Mayan calendar, they built it on a circle. It's a circle. It means it has no beginning. It has no end. One cycle ends and another cycle begins, and over and over and over for eternity. And in that Mayan calendar, there's been many times when uh, the so-called end of the earth or the end of the cycle was listed. And uh, we're still here. You know, that's happened many times in the past, and, and, uh, and life goes on. It's simply a question of the cycles. And the Illuminati have taken that uh, that calendar and turned it into something that it is not uh, with this 2012 uh, end of the world scenario. You know, on December 22nd, 2012, the day after the so-called end of the Mayan calendar, well, the world's going to continue. In fact, the Mayan elders laugh at uh, the Americans and Europeans who believe in this because there was one Mayan elder who said, you know, on, the, on December 22nd, I'm going to get up and make my coffee and watch TV like I do every day. So nothing's going to be different. It's simply a question of what you believe is going to happen to you. And the Illuminati have an agenda where they want complete and global domination and control by the end of 2012. And so that is why they have taken the Mayan calendar and use it as a symbol uh, for themselves and to create fear and panic about the end of the world and then create disasters here and there to make it look like it's actually happening. And they make movies about it and they make television shows. And really, it's just a bunch of hype. You know, just like the comet Elenin was a bunch of hype. It's falling apart, the disintegrating. It's not coming anywhere near us. And so... Uh, these are the things that people need to look at both logically and energetically and say, okay, you know, it, the, the world is what we make it. It's what we project out. And that's why I use the analogy that thought is like film, the brain is the projector, and physical reality is the screen. So if you don't like the movie that's playing around you, you need to change the film, which is the way you think. 
you change your thought bands and the whole world around you is going to change. So if you expect disaster and you create that mentally, that's what you will experience. If you create peace and, and harmony, that is what you experience. And so that's what Dolores is really talking about there as far as twin earth. It's really not a twin earth. It's your perspective. It's like, what are you going to experience? You know, there could be two people sitting in the same room. One person thinks it's hot and uncomfortable. Another person thinks the room is perfect temperature and very, and very comfortable. They're both in the same place, but they're experiencing two different things. And that's because of their mind pattern. And so times that by 7 billion people on this planet, and you will see what experiences can be projected out for people to uh, have in, the, in their life. And so that's why I say don't go by predictions, don't go by calendars. All of these things are, are false. You need and we need, all of us need to project out into the world what we wish for ourselves and for our loved ones, both individually and collectively, and that's what we will experience, no matter what else is going on around us. Thanks for saying that. You actually made me laugh, because to me it's so obvious. But I actually know people that are now hermiting in their homes, and they're getting ready for the great destruction. And it just it, it makes me shake my head, because it isn't going to happen. But you can't right. tell them that. But you know, you know, Ms. Muggsy, they're going to create that for themselves, see? And uh, that's their pathway. And, and you know, that's why people say to me, oh, what are you supposed to do? Well, I, I use, again, I like to use analogies because it helps to explain things. And, and you may have heard me say this once before, but, you know, I, I look at it like this. I see people running with their blindfolds on towards the edge of a cliff. So what's my responsibility? Do I take the new age route and say, well, that's their karma, they just have to fly off the cliff? Or, or do I have a responsibility to stop them? Or, but then I'm imposing my will on them. So I decided the best thing to do is to say, hey, to these people, you know, pull down your blindfolds, look where you're going, you're going towards the cliff. Then I let them go and say, okay, now it's up to you. You can keep running or you could stop, but at least I told you what, what's lying ahead. And, and so that's kind of what I do in my work. I tell people what I see, uh, what's lying ahead, and uh, I, can, I can tell them what they can do about it, but it's up to them to accept or reject it and do as they see fit for themselves. I agree completely. I have the same philosophy. At least they have the information. What they do with it is up to them. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay, here's another area that... It's not, there's nothing on the internet that I can find that talks about the original, um, how do I want to say that, the Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. To me, it, the, it, the concept is being misconstrued. It's not what we think it is. Can you tell me your version? Uh, you're talking about Nibiru and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well... Yeah, you know, and I, I mentioned this, oh, eight years ago. Um, the the so-called Planet X, uh, Nibiru, uh, does not exist anymore. It was destroyed by Particle Beam Accelerator in uh, April of 2003 as it came close to Jupiter. And that is why when you watch the NASA Sun Cam, which is the satellites focusing on the on the sun, you will see huge chunks of uh, objects flying into the sun, burning up in the sun's uh, corona. Uh, you will see uh, you know little meteors and asteroids flying past our planet constantly now, because this is the remnant, the the bits of the destruction from from what was left of that planet that was destroyed. Um, and why was it destroyed? Because um, the Abenaki or the Anunnaki and, and Nibiru was headed towards this area in their 3,600 year rotation. They had stargates that they had left under what is now Baghdad. And so in March of 2003, uh, we invaded Iraq. 
They went immediately to Baghdad uh, without being stopped, and they went immediately to the museums in Baghdad and looted them, and, went, and they went to underground uh, places uh, in Baghdad to destroy the Stargate so that the uh, Anunnaki could not uh, transport here. And then they destroyed uh, Nibiru. And, um, you know, people can accept that or not accept it, but that's what I know happened back in 2003. So there's nothing like that coming here anymore. It's not, it doesn't exist. I have seen something that looks like a planet, and you can see, well, not it looks like a planet, but it moves like a spaceship. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what that would be? Yes, and I've talked about this a lot, and there's a lot of them, actually. And that is out in the Kuiper Belt, in the outer ring of our solar system. Uh, and I have mentioned this many times. I know that there is a fleet massing in the Kuiper Belt. It's basically surrounding our solar system, and it is threat uh, or threatening the Illuminati, and that's why the Illuminati are acting so uh, irrationally and and uh, quickly these days because they don't know what to expect from this large group. And you may recall uh, earlier this year, last year, uh, there were these objects seen emanating from the sun, um, and when they were digitally enhanced, you could see they were huge, almost planet-sized spaceships. They were portholes. There was, uh, you could see equipment devices on them, and they headed right towards the Kuiper Belt where they joined this huge fleet that's surrounding our solar system. Because the sun, or any star, acts as a stargate. A black hole in one universe is a star in another, and vice versa, and that's how energy is uh, transported or balanced between the parallel universes. And so our sun is also a portal through which vehicles can enter into this uh, time space. And that's what we've been seeing over the last couple of years. Uh, no one really knows what the agenda is for these uh, beings in the Kuiper Belt. And there's more than one race. There's many, many different races there that have never been seen before. But apparently, they're here to create some kind of blockade uh, so people or we can't get in and out or the Illuminati can't get in and out. Um, and uh, my feeling is that they may make a move sometime in the next year or so, so that not only could there be a staged alien invasion, uh, but there could also be a real one. Well, I've, I've actually seen that, too. I've had dreams about it, and I've been told intuitively about it, but I don't get um, – I, I get that they're benevolent. Um, I actually I can tap into um, some of them, but um, I also got too, and I don't know if you did, but a new, uh, it, a, a, for lack of words, a galactic battleship of a huge magnitude. It's like 27 miles long. Um, arrived in our solar system on Saturday, and they're supposed to round up the um, the Anunnaki that are here on this planet, along with the greys. Do you well, know anything about that? No, that I, ha I don't know anything about that one. I just know that, uh, first of all, the greys, the so-called greys, they're, they're dying out. They're a dying species. Um, they, uh, they're an artificial species as well. They're not natural. Um, I also know that, uh, again, I go back to the Kuiper Belt information, um, and there's a lot of vessels out there, and they're huge. Some of them are the size of the planet Earth. Um, and, there's, and, and even NASA had reported a huge object in the Kuiper Belt that they said was hurling uh, meteors and asteroids at this planet. I mean, that was, a, that was on conventional news. And they even said that there was an energy from the Kuiper Belt that was blocking the Pioneer spacecraft from getting past the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It was pushing it back. I mean, this was on conventional news like CNN and Fox. So this isn't just New Age stuff or La La stuff. This is, you know, fact that's being reported on our news. And, and, and uh, you know... The Illuminati report things, and then they don't. They stop. So if you miss it, 
you lose. And that's why I monitor all the news all the time from around the world because I want to see what they're telling people. Uh, so yes, there is something going on. Uh, it is uh, uh, some type of a battle that's happening. My feeling is that that comet Elenin was really an artificial device that was uh, coming towards the planet, either to monitor or to create some kind of an event uh, to let people know that they were being, uh, you know, watched. Um, and I think the Illuminati were very worried and concerned about it. Uh, now we find out that this comet Elenin is actually disintegrating and falling apart. Um, and so it remains to be seen what will happen when it gets into the vicinity of our planet next month. Uh, but my feeling is it's going to be just a light show. It's going to give some kind of an information out that can't be stopped by the Illuminati uh, to let people know that there's more out there than they're being told. I agree completely. And, you know, some people just, they love the drama of it. And I like to see what's going on, but I, I just have no fear because I just know we're going to be taken care of. I just know. So I don't fear. Um, can we have some fun? I want to do something different. Um, in your travels, when you, you can time travel, correct? Anybody can, yes. Well, I mean, you do it really well. I was wondering if you could tell us, like, in our future, um, what kind of technology did you see that humans get to use? What's brought in that's new? Well, that's a very interesting uh, topic because, uh, for example, in Montauk, when we did our hyperspace work and we went out of the time-space sequences into the, the future, they were really potential futures, meaning that depending on what decisions were made in any given moment would create different uh, future timelines. So when we looked at the future, there were many possibilities that happened. And we didn't know, you know, which is the one that will be chosen, see? So there were timelines in the future where, unfortunately, humans did destroy themselves and there was no future. There were timelines where uh, there was interaction with alien beings who brought amazing technology into our planet. Um, and there, was, uh, there were timelines where, pe where things just developed uh, kind of naturally uh, on their own. But the bottom line was things do change. And uh, there is a greater likelihood that they will get better in the far future. The kind of technology that was generally observed was one where the human brain and nervous system interacted automatically with, uh, with the, uh, the environment so that by thinking of, let's say, an apple, you created an apple. Uh, by, by tapping into uh, embedded uh, chips in the walls and floors, etc., like this, you could actually uh, get information constantly about what's going on anywhere in the world or in the solar system just by thinking. Or you could communicate with anyone mentally at any time uh, simply by thinking about them, which you can do anyway mentally, but there were enhancements uh, artificially around. So basically, the future does hold w kinds of technology that today we would think of almost like magic. Um, there were ovens, let's say, in the kitchen where it just looked like a countertop, nothing on it. But then when you touch the countertop, uh, a cooking surface appeared. And then you press somewhere else, and a menu appeared. And uh, the utensils came right out of the countertop, and you could just cook you know, with your, with your fingers, basically, by pointing and touching and, and, and moving your hands in a certain way. So there's like, quite amazing technology uh, that's waiting for people uh, and, not, and not in the very far future either. There are also computers that will be using human DNA instead of computer chips. So it's quite a fascinating future ahead, and hopefully we'll all get together and create one that's a good one without any oppression or tyranny. 
You just described 5D. I mean, people that have talked about like the Andromedans or the Syrians or when they describe what it's like in the fifth dimension, you just described it. Are you aware of that? Well, you know, because in the future, human beings will energetically uh, advance to the point where they're kind of borderline physical, non-physical. So just by thinking, there's a more of an instant manifestation than in the pure physical. That's amazing. Um, what is your analysis on the Norway spiral? I've heard so many analysis. Yeah, yeah, What's yours? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, Pizza. also, I wrote about that when it happened. Uh, you can actually, at some point, see the satellite that's transmitting those images. It's basically Blue Beam Project, where they create holographic images in the sky um, in order to uh, create a situation on the Earth. They can make it look like uh, a religious figure. They can make it look like a UFO. They could make it look like uh, you know an alien attack. In this case, they made a spiral. Um, but uh, when you look behind the spiral, you can actually see the satellite device that's a part of the Blue Beam project that created that image in the sky. I have that on one of my websites. It's called EmpoweringBetterHealth.com, and it shows how Project Blue Beam creates that exact spiral and how it opens up like a black hole area and and that's exactly what the Norway spiral does so uh, I'm mm -hmm. glad you said that um, okay here's an area that I, I'm really vague on the Zionist bloodlines where is that opposed to the reptilians versus the Anunnaki versus the 300 family and the Illuminati I mean can you put that all together for me Please? Well, they're kind of all the same thing, and I do have this flow chart where I show, you know, from uh, Sumer, from ancient Sumer, uh, that's when the one of the final stages of hybridization began, where the reptilians did more blending with the mammalians and created a what they call the blue bloods because they had more copper in their blood and when copper oxidizes it creates more of a blue green color so they were called blue blue bloods and they also were able to shape shift the ones who had a 50 50 genetic split but from sumer it basically morphed into mesopotamia which became babylon which then moved further north into the caucasus mountains and created the Khazar Empire at the Caspian Sea. And the Khazar Empire moved uh, westward and eastward into Asia and into Europe, where they blended with the Magdalene lineage and created the Merovingians. And the Merovingians then developed into the Illuminati, uh, the 13 families that uh, control the planet right now. And uh, the uh, 13 families then uh, had uh, connections to families called the Committee of 300 who worked in close support of the Illuminati all the time. So the Illuminati were the top of the triangle, and the next layer, or the pyramid, I should say, and the next layer were the uh, Committee of 300. Now, that's, that's one uh, layer here. Then we have uh, the, um, the tribes of Israel uh, who were also part of Sumer, um, and they left uh, during the occupation. The, the ten, there were ten tribes that are called the ten missing tribes, and they blended also in with the Khazars, and they went into Europe where they became many of the European tribes there. You know, the Danube River was named after the Hebrew tribe of Don, and uh, there are many, um, the Turks, and they won't like to hear this story, but the Turks uh, also were descendants of uh, one of the missing tribes of Israel. And uh, it goes on and on and on, and they spread all over Asia and Africa and Europe and blended with the, uh, the Merovingians and the, and the Khazars. And so we, we have this whole mishmash of genetics. You know, there's really no one that's a pure blood anything 
because there's such mixing over the thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so now, at the end of this time here, we have the the bottom line of the 13 families, the Committee of 300, and all the sub-organizations that are descended from them um, that break out into every aspect of uh, our society. You know, and, and when we talk about Illuminati families or blue bloods, that doesn't mean they're wealthy because there's a whole cadre of Illuminati that are uh, considered lower socioeconomic levels, and that's because they need to be at every level of society in order to create a control system. You know, they need to have their arm or their, their fingers in every part of humanity, no matter where it is. Uh, so, you know, Zionist bloodline, Illuminati, it's really all connected to the same thing, which is the hybridization of Sumer, uh, which was actually uh, connected also to Lemuria and Atlantis. Uh, and it goes all the way back into that ancient history. And I would uh, urge uh, people interested in this information to read my Blue Blood book and even watch my DVDs on True World History. I have three, three sets of DVDs, True World History 1, 2, and 3, where I go over all of this massive information in very, very close detail. Um, and this October, next month, we're having our next annual conference here in St. Joseph, um, and it's going to be on interdimensional existences, and I'm going to give the final pieces on all of this uh, history uh, so that it pulls it all together. So it's going to be a very, very interesting uh, time, and I, I would encourage everyone uh, to come to that conference. What about... Um I don't understand shapeshifters versus the hologram, and um, what's the difference between the reptilian eyes and the black eyes? Okay. First of all, um, we talked about shapeshifting earlier. When you have a genetic mix in one body that is 50% mammalian and 50% reptilian, then we have a body that could go either way, either to look mammalian or reptilian. So how does it know what to do? It depends on the soul personality that enters the body. If there is a mammalian soul personality that enters that body, the DNA will then uh, defer to the mammalian manifestation. On the other hand, if it's a reptilian uh, mind pattern that enters the body, it'll look more reptilian. If, the, you know, let's say, there's a reptilian energy in this 50-50 uh, split body and it wants to look human, then it has to ingest human hormones, organs, blood, everything that it takes to shift the energy then back towards the human or mammalian side, and then the body will shift or shape shift <clears throat> to that. And that's what uh, the, they do during uh, rituals uh, in, in the Illuminati culture. Now, the reptilian eyes, the ones with the split, you know, kind of look like a cat's eyes, but sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're even red. Um, that will happen when the reptilian DNA activates and becomes, um, act, you know, manifest that, that shape. The ones with the black eyes, they're really um, more alien, not so much reptilian, but they could be uh, more uh, actually insect-like um, because there's a lot of insect-like aliens out there, and they've created hybrids of mammalian and insect where um, the eyes can shift to the black color that an insect would have. Um, so there's, real, there's many different hybrids uh, on the planet, uh, and so you need to really be specific about the, if it's a reptilian, is it an insect, is it another one? I mean, there's many, many uh, out there. The very famous story years ago about the Mothman, you know, that was in West Virginia and Ohio, and he had red eyes, and he looked like a moth with a human kind of head on it, and, and that's the hybridization of those two species. 
You know, they've spent decades, uh, basically uh, since the 40s, and the Germans were doing it since the 20s, in mixing the different genetics of different species to create these hybrids uh, that could work in different environments without the use of apparatus uh, to help them because they had a body that could uh, understand uh, commands and yet work in strange environments. And uh, we're going to be seeing more and more of those as time goes on because now they're even admitting on conventional news that they have added human DNA to animals and they've created human ears on the back of mice and they've created uh, fish that glow in the dark and all kinds of things that are already out there. And that's only what they admit to. So you can just imagine what they're not telling you. Thank you. That put a lot of pieces together. What about, okay, I know that I hear this a lot, that, that, that there are um, the shapeshifters or the reptilians that um, want to asc ascend, ascend and have the higher consciousness. And some of them, I have been told, um, are really helpful people. Um, and they, they do help humanity in certain ways so that we can all work together in this ascension and, and bringing up our energy. What are the chances that the Illuminati is going to say, you know, killing all these people is bunk? I think we're going to change sides and help humanity and ascend with them in a loving way. What are our chances? I think there's a better chance that the Ayatollah in Iran will become a fundamentalist Christian. If that answers your question, I think there's no chance of that happening. Why? Because the Illuminati don't think like that. They have an agenda for complete domination and control, and there's no other there's no other pathway for them. They're not here. There's not their mind pattern to assist or help others, except themselves. And so there's they have no concept. Of, uh, of upgrading themselves to a more spiritual level, that's not what their, their agenda is. Their agenda is to make people think that they are cut off from the God mind and that the Illuminati are their gods. And that's their, that's their entire programming, mind control system. That's what their society is based on. It has been since, since they began. And there's no change in that. Okay, so what are the chances that uh, what happens if we can um, excommunicate in some benevolent way the top level of the Illuminati and perhaps maybe once the control mechanism is out of here, maybe then the 300 families would change their direction. What do you think of that? You know, again, you know, this is like a new age kind of la la philosophy. You, you know, you send love and light. That that doesn't mean anything. You know, they they just don't have that mindset to do that. You know, it's like it's like you're saying, well, what happens if a cat decides it wants to become a dog? Well, it's not. It's a cat, and it's going to do cat things. It's not going to do dog things. So the Illuminati, the Committee of Three Hundred. They have their genetics, they have their mind pattern, they have their history. That's what they're going to do. They're not going to say, hey, you know what, you know, we're wrong, we're just going to be loving now. That's not going to happen. You know, they, they are what they are. And so either they're going to go away or they're going to fulfill what their agenda is. There's, there's not anything in between for them. Uh, that's how they are. You know, uh, that's their that's their uh, culture, and uh, that's why the Kuiper Belt beings are going to do what they're going to do. Okay, so so basically, it seems like from what you're saying that they're they're going to fight themselves to the death to try to enslave us. That they're going to carry this mission yeah. out no matter what. Absolutely, there's not a question about it. Okay, so then what about, 
Okay, in your opinion, can humanity then, can we get our control back? Can we get our power back from these people so they can't enslave us? And if so, how would you recommend that? Well, that's just the whole thing. They don't have power over us. We give them the power. And it goes back to the victimization mind pattern. That attracts the tyrants and the oppressors. So we each individually and collectively are responsible for the existence of the Illuminati. And so if humanity changes this and removes the victimization mentality, then the Illuminati can have no control over us. So that's why I do the work that I do and teach the release work and the programming work and the empowering work in the hopes that each person will do this and teach it to other people so that there will be a critical mass that will arise in humanity that will spill over to the rest and then the Illuminati cannot have any power because we won't be giving them the power. They are only reflecting what we are projecting out. If we stop projecting that, they cannot exist. Where do they go? They go on their own way. They go wherever they're going to go. They'll go to a planet that's at a lower energy level so they can control them. Or they will be destroyed. Or, you know, or plan C will happen. We can't, you know, just put it all in one package, you know, because they have free will also. And so there could be many possibilities that happen for them. But that's their stuff, and that's not even for us to even think about what they're going to do. We need to think about what we're going to do. What about the Galactic Empire? You spoke about that in some of your videos. Yes, there is um, a collection or a confederation of uh, originally Lyrian refugees that banded together to create this galactic federation. Uh, it's not the kind uh, that you've heard about in New Age philosophy. Uh, it's more like, uh, uh, by comparison, what uh, NATO would be for us on Earth. It's a group that bands together to protect uh, common interests. Um, so, yes, so once the Illuminati are no longer in power here, when that happens, then we could become associated with groups like that. I'm really big on happy thoughts. Um, could you give us a glimpse of what you saw when the Illuminati is removed and what happens to our society and how we become... Um, in the future, what what did you see? Well, the in almost all cases, in in scenarios where the Illuminati were not here anymore, it was then a connection with other uh, alien species, uh, both in this physical universe and in parallel universes that uh, connect to humanity um, only after humanity reaches a point where they are accepting and not hostile. Because there are many, many different species out there. You know, somebody recently asked me, well, are the aliens good or bad? Well, that's like saying, you know, are Americans good or bad? There's good and bad in ev everyone, you know, and, and different species. And there's billions of different species out there. So, you know, who are you, who are you referring to? Um, and, and, and categorically... The benevolent species do not interfere. You know, if they, people keep waiting for these wonderful aliens to come and help and save us, that's not going to happen. The ones who come here are the ones who interfere, and they have their own agenda. Even the beings in the Kuiper Belt that I talk about, um, that I feel will uh, either scare the Illuminati away or eliminate them, uh, they're not love, light, and peace either. They're out to, uh, to protect their own uh, agenda. Uh, however, I think they're not as harsh as the Illuminati, so that's a, a good factor. Uh, but the bottom line is, the future of the Earth is connecting to other species, uh, to other alien groups, physical and non-physical. That is our future. 
Um, and so the question remains, uh, how will humanity deal with that? Will they be accepting? Will they be rejecting? Uh, will they upgrade themselves intellectually and spiritually? That remains to be seen. But my opinion is that it has to happen in, in that way uh, where we do finally you know, get it and, and, and join with others of like mind to have a, a better uh, life in this solar system and in this galaxy. Okay, this question, I'm going to leave up to you. Um, you have a wealth of information that I know I haven't even scratched on. I just tried to highlight some different things so that people will pick up your books and, and read more. Out of everything that you know and what you want to teach people, what would that subject be? And what do you want to say to people that would be important for Stuart to to teach that issue? My main objective is for people to know who and what they are. And that involves going within to connect to their oversoul, to the God mind within, to connect to their true essence of who and what they have been and what they are and what they can be. They're always in a state of becoming. You're never any one thing. You are becoming something else always and that's because the god mind within is doing that and we are each a reflection of the god mind so that's why i treat i i teach and research true world history and and galactic history so people know what their origins are i teach exercises for people to uh, connect to their uh, inner selves, their true personalities, to reintegrate all the fragmentation so that they become whole again and understand uh, their connection to the non-physical. Uh, that is what my hope is for people. And again, <clears throat> I don't try to impose it on anyone. I don't make it. I can't make anyone believe it. It's just a question of what they accept or reject. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, that's what I, I teach. And, and, and by doing the hyperspace work, the visualizations, that gives them their own answers. It shows them that with their own minds, they can achieve anything. Human beings really only use 10% or less of their total brain capacity and only 3% of their DNA capacity. So can you even imagine what a person could do or what functions they could perform if they open up the other percentages of what they're not using? It's absolutely incredible to see the totality of a person when they become fully um, manifested in both physical and non-physical manners. And that's my goal, is for people to realize that from within themselves and to forgive themselves for what they perceive as the negativity and release that. Because, you know, we all are here to learn. We are all expressions of the God mind. It gives us experiences so that it can know itself through us. And no intermediary is necessary. We can do this directly from ourselves to the God mind. And that's what I want people to know, that you are and have within you right now everything you could ever need or want in existence. And it's up to each one of us to access that and manifest it and express it. And that's what I hope uh, to impart uh, to, to humanity in, in my own way. You mentioned the DNA, and I know we're only using two strands, and we have 22. So we have 20 strands that aren't being used. Is that I, something... I, dis I disagree with that. That's, I, I, that's false. Okay. Explain yours. My, my question was, is do we on our own, can we ignite our own DNA? And number two, um, is it something that the higher energies is doing for us, the sunbursts and stuff like that? Okay. You know, no one's doing anything for us. We have to do it for ourselves. There's a Chinese saying that says when you give a man a fish, you, you feed him for a day. 
but when you teach him how to fish, you feed him for life. And so if, if we don't learn our lessons, if we don't learn how to fish, we're doomed as a, as a society and as, as, a, as a species. So as I mentioned earlier, no benevolent, truly benevolent species is going to interfere because they know that's wrong, cosmically incorrect. We have to learn our lessons. You know, and so um, as far as DNA is concerned, there are only two strands. It doesn't matter if you're an amoeba, an elephant, a human, an alien. There's only one way that DNA can manifest together the the uh, the four protein bases connecting is through two strands. If you have 22 strands, that's a monstrosity. It, uh, it can't even connect properly. You know, if, uh, DNA is physical. There's no nothing non-physical about it. It's the physical manifestation of who and what we are, and it can only come together in a double helix, and that's throughout the universes, that's just the way it is. And all these talk about 12 strands and 20 strands, and all, that's just new age malarkey, I'm sorry, but that's just what it is. Nobody can create a model that proves anything else because it's not possible to connect it. Uh, we're just two, it's two strands, the double helix, that's DNA throughout uh, existence everywhere. And as far as activation is concerned, well, that's what I'm talking about, the other 97% of the DNA, what scientists call junk DNA, is really all of the God-mind information that's within us. Because every species, no matter what it is, that 97% is identical. That 97% is identical whether you're a honeybee or a daisy or an amoeba or a human. It's the same 97%. It comes from the same place, which is the God mind. And so it's only that 3% that we are actually using, and we need to open up the rest of it so that we can actualize who and what we really are. And that's the whole point of existence, because that's been locked up for ages by those who seek to uh, keep mankind from progressing. And so it's up to each one of us to do our work and open up that locked portion of ourselves so that we can express the true nature of who and what we are. Okay, i got five minutes left. What, what can us followers that love your work, where can we find you? What are you going to be doing in the future? And um, what goals do you want to accomplish as a man living this existence? Five minutes. <laughs> oh, all that in five minutes. Well, go, <laughs> no. everybody go to expansions.com, read my news, see the information we have up there. Come to our October conference next month. Believe me, you will learn more than you ever realized you can learn and experience amazing things in that weekend. Uh, next week, uh, we will be going to Central America, so any of you in Central America who wish to see me, please contact us through the website. Also in November, we will be going on an Atlantean cruise to discover the energies of Atlantis, which is now rising up in the Caribbean. That is also posted on Expansions.com. Please uh, go to the site and read all that information. Uh, what I wish to accomplish as a man living on this world, I, I, you know, I, I hope I'm in the process of doing so. Um, my hope is that I'm able to teach even a small percentage of the people on this planet about their true nature so that they'll be able to teach it to others. And I'm hoping that within my lifetime I will see the tide turn so that there is no more oppression and poverty and, and, and hatred on this planet so that we really can, all of us together, turn it into a paradise that it is meant to be. And uh, like I say, we need to all join together, all the like minds get together. Uh, on my website, there are forums that you can communicate with each other and, and share ideas. There is a comment form where you can comment on the articles and ask questions. Uh, please come to my website, expansions.com, and, and, and see what's there. Uh, come to the conferences in October. Join us in November. Uh, we have something, and I'll, I'll be in Africa in, uh, in December. If people in Africa want to see me again, 
Uh, everything uh, I do is hopefully to help all of you in the best way I can. I'm open to all your suggestions of what you would like to see me do or what you need me to do, and I, I will look at all of that. So please communicate with us. Uh, we're, we're always available. Uh, even when we're not here, we have people who monitor the, the website for us. Uh, so again, expansions.com, I hope to uh, see and hear all of you. And you're also on Facebook. On Facebook, Twitter, I'm every place. I got a question for you, um, a new one. Um, do you have any idea where your soul is connected to? Do you know which planet? You see, that, that it's, it's everywhere. Your, your soul personality is connected everywhere. You, you exist everywhere at all times. It's just a matter of where you're focused. And we've all had experiences on other worlds. All of us are aliens to the Earth. None of us originated here. And so, yes, if you do your work, your mental work, your hyperspace work, you will find out where you're connected to, which is just about everywhere. Well, what is your last memory? Of the, the last world? Or your strongest the, one. Yeah. Well, I would, I would have to say Sirius A. I was going to say that, too. Yeah, that's my, that's where uh, I have a soft spot for them, even though I'm not so thrilled with them anymore. Yeah, but you, you are um, so in a line with their personality, your, the way you communicate, the way that you think, the way that you phrase your sentences. I mean, it's just uncanny how much you have in, um, that is very familiar to me with the Syrian A personalities. So oh, I, appreci well, I appreciate you noticing that. Well, I I love Syrian A people because you guys come in, you get the job done, you don't mess around. If something stinks, you say it stinks, <laughs> you know? True. That's very true. So anyway, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us your time and teaching us about these subjects that some just won't even touch. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Ms. Muggsy. And I appreciate your audience and your show. Oh, thanks, Stuart. We'd like to have you back. Maybe you can give us an update sometime. Sure, absolutely. I would love to. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye, okay, everybody. everybody. Um, that's it. We're going to, um, it went by so fast. I just love this man's information. And it, like he said, on YouTube, he has videos. Uh, he is available on Facebook, his website, and they're very good at getting back at you. And I, I did find that he does fill in a lot of the voids and gaps uh, that others just aren't discussing or they don't discuss it well. And because of his directness and his Syrian A personality, um, he, he, he just puts it out there so you don't have to ever wonder, well, did he mean this? Because you always know what he's thinking. Um, and he, he says it so well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. And this is 9-11. And I really would like to appreciate that everybody... Be in a happy mood because today is the day that we make our change. This is the day that humanity makes the strike back and we take our planet back. So please tonight when you go to bed, say a prayer, bless yourself and give the whole world as much love as you can from the heart. And let's see if we can't motivate more people to start getting into this consciousness. So thank you so much. And next week, I'm not sure who I have. It might be Lisa Harrison, so we'll know more about her and um, David Ike. So check back with us next Sunday. Thank you, and have a great week. Bye-bye.